beautiful angel of the morning, you. It's so good to see you. You too, as always. Or I should say, <laughs> as per use. As per use, episode 313, palindrome today. Ooh, I like it. Feeling good. I'm so mm-hmm. proud. I, I don't know why I've been reflecting so much on our show, but I am so proud of what we've created. <laughs> Me too, Suze. I know that sounds Aww. kind of silly, because why now? It's why not am I silly. thinking this? But. I just, I've noticed how the brainiacs just keep getting better. They keep sending yeah. really great stories and, um, you know, topic ideas. And I'm like, we have the best listeners. I love it. Yes, They're I so totally nice. agree. Snaps. Yeah. Woo, 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 woo. <laughs> what is that from, Snaps? Uh, uh, Legally Blonde. Oh, right, right. Oh, oh my gosh. This is a perfect way to introduce one of the stories that I have for Let's today. Let's hear it. Would you like to know about the history of the high five? Yes. Right? Sarah. I'm, I knew you would be into it. I'm <laughs> so excited. Okay, so I, got, we, I was inspired by this when Land and I were watching some commercial for something, and it was like going through all these facts or something like that, and they were like, history of the high five, create, or like invented by, or like the high five, in, invented by, and like named this baseball player real quick, and I was like, what, what, wait a sec, that's an color that's wait a sec what the high five i thought that's been around for forever yeah right it's like blinking that's what i thought when do you think the high five like you know how we can always go to the dictionary for like the history of Uh when do you think the oxford english dictionary started using Mm. the word high five okay 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 it's got to be 1957 (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> That's so precise, which is so funny. Uh, no, 1980. No way. Can you yeah. believe that, right? Isn't no, that I cool? can't. Okay, so there's two stories that, that are kind of like, people don't know which is which one to, um, yeah. you know, but but what do they call it? The, the conventional story. wisdom. Yeah, the conventional wisdom says that the high five originally occurred between a baseball player named Dusty Baker and Glenn Burke of the Los Angeles Dodgers Shut at Dodger Stadium up. in 1977. Okay, so it was like the last inning, the regular season. Yep. <clears throat> and it was big. Ba- oh, and the story gets so much better. You're going to love this <laughs> because, yeah, for like a bunch of reasons. So, <laughs> okay. okay, so it's like, that so a journalist i'm going to read you what a journalist said about the story they said it was a wild triumphant moment and a good omen as the dodgers headed to the playoffs burke waiting on deck thrust his hand enthusiastically over his head to greet his friend at the plate baker not knowing what to do smacked it his hand was up in the air he said and he was arching his back so i reached up and hit his hand it seemed like a good thing to do no isn't that funny they just like described a high five which like kind of made me laugh yeah but (laughs) This is the really interesting part of the story. So um, Burke, this baseball player, he was traded around. He was really like young. The guy was like 25 when he was playing. He was traded around and ended up on a team where he had, uh, he was also, he was gay. And like he obviously couldn't be out about it. He was also a black man. So he's black man, he's gay. And he ended up in a relationship with the son of the, either the manager or the coach or the owner of the baseball team. Oh Lord. And the baseball, they were like, no, no way. So he got traded down to like triple (laughs) A ball and then ended up retiring in like when he was 27 from baseball and he moved to San Francisco. And then the high five became like a gay culture like a thing up, in gay culture because up. he went around high-fiving and that was like it turned into like it says the high five was used with other gay residents of the castro district for what many it became a symbol of gay pride and identification shut up isn't this cool yes and apparently there's – now I now in reading this article, I, didn't, I brushed over this, but there's an ESPN 30 for 30 film called The High Five where Shut they talk up. about this. So I now we have to watch that. I am dying. We have to watch that. I mean, amazing. And he said he was the, one of the first – oh, I didn't know. After he retired, he was one of the first openly gay professional athletes. So he – and then he came out. So isn't that cool? I am so happy right now. Yep. So I'm going to go with that. You made my day. Oh, yay. I was so excited. I've been like sitting on the story and like like putting it together <laughs> for like two weeks while you've been gone. I like it was inspired by the commercial that looked at the history that like that. this. And I'm like, oh, I can't wait for Su- for me to come in with the history of the high five for Susie. I can't believe that something that seems like just an innate 
human behavior, like mm-hmm. laughing, you know how mm-hmm. they try to figure out like, is smiling a social construct or is it um, inborn in mm-hmm. babies? It's like that yeah. where I feel like the high five is so basic to human uh, contact now that yeah. it seems crazy that someone actually thought I'm going to hit his hand. Right. There and was a so- moment. Right. A moment where then, okay, so they also make sure in in a few of these articles on like the high five, they talk about how, you know, there were other moments uh, like where somebody hitting each other's hand has been like captured on, you know, film or on camera or something like that. But nobody ever titled it a high five. Like that's it. We didn't like label it. This is a high five. But I'm going to put, there's a great article in The Advocate um, and it talks all about this. Uh, like about the, uh, you know, the baseball player Burke. Yeah. And his whole, you know, story about, you know, being See, a, a gay baseball player and all this stuff. And it's so great. And so I'm going to add it Just when you the, think the gays couldn't get any cooler. Yeah. They right. do something like this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right? He's so exactly. happy it right says, now. It said he became known around the Castro as a neighborhood figure. And in 19, 1982, he came out in Insider Sports. Where Michael him. J. Smith called the high five a defiant symbol of gay pride. No, unfortunately, he passed away in uh, 1995 from HIV. Damn it. Yeah. Oh, and it's so sad. In, obit- in his obituary, it said the man who invented the high five at the end of his life could barely lift his arm. I can't take it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> this is too much. Mm-hmm. Oh, my God. I, I but- did not see this coming. <laughs> oh, I love it. I'm so excited. I'm getting like, like, you know, warm, tingly feelings from making Ugh. Susie excited about a story. A really cool service, by the way, that will make you feel like you're getting like a high five yes. as well is something called Noom. And Noom is new to me. I hadn't heard of it. And it's yeah, really- I don't know about this. Okay. Here's the scoop because I was going to say to you, have you ever heard of Noom? No. So it's basically an app that you can use that will help you make healthier choices and have a healthier oh. lifestyle. Well, and, uh, <laughs> where do I sign up? Right, because, well, here's the thing. I think a lot of people will be inclined to use it for weight loss and things like that. But for me, it's just like perfect for a healthier lifestyle in general. Like you and I both suffer with self-care problems. Yep. <laughs> like I'll be just not, I just won't eat. Yeah. You know, yeah. and so this is a great app if you would like some guidance on here's a better way to change your habit and have more success in your life. I went on and I took this little quiz and if you you put in like maybe your goal weight or whatever and then it'll tell you a plan for you on what you can uh accomplish and they'll give you a goal specialist to help you. I think a lot of people oh. have bad habits that they might need help with, right? Mm, yep. And then there's also a community that's there for you. You can have group discussions with other members, keep you encouraged. I think a lot of people that might be doing the food stuff really struggle with like tracking the food and it's kind of agony to, I used to use an app for that and it's really an unpleasant (laughs) experience. So this is a better way to do it. Um, Whatever healthy goals you want to set, Noom is designed for results. It's out with old habits, in with the new. Sign up for your trial today at Noom. That's n o o m dot com slash brain candy. What do you have to lose? Visit Noom dot com slash brain candy to start your trial today. Again, that's Noom dot com slash brain candy. Start losing weight for good, or whatever your goals happen to be. Um, yeah, man. Yeah, I'm all about. Use it. You know how we always complain about technology? Well, if you're going to use it, which we all do, might as well be for like something that uh, inc- improves your life. Which yes. reminds me, because I kept using the word like and uh, during that last segment, and I want to encourage our listeners, instead of a swear jar for Linda, I am oh. going to do a like jar. Oh, and I yeah. would like... Unless I'm using it in the way that I just did. Right, right. Um, But if I use it as like a verbal pause like that, like that, like that, then I want you guys to count them up and tell me my total for the episode and I will donate a dollar for each time to charity. Oh my God, this is great. I cannot stand how often I say like and I have to stop. Oh my gosh. Now I'm going to be aware of it for me. Oh, it will make you crazy. Yeah. Because you don't realize how often you say it. 
And so I would like your help on holding me accountable for okay. however long it takes. Um, so just give me a total, whoever you are, tag me and say, Suze, you said it 20 times or whatever it is. I will make a check. All right. Is it like charity. starting now? now. <laughs> okay. I okay. think I just said it in that sentence. <laughs> oh my See? gosh. Now it's one of those things that's been planted in my head. I probably didn't use that as a verbal pause and now I'm going to. Oh no. <laughs> oh, that's funny. It's just a part of the lexicon to mm-hmm. a degree that is alarming to me. Yeah. And I need to get a handle on it. Mm. So I need your All help. Right. Call to action. Um, I love it. Call to action. So I finally read that article that I told you I was going to read about Shen Yun, you know, the... Oh, yes, 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 yes. Asian dance troupe that is yes. uh, ubiquitously um, promoted, at least here in LA. I never saw it in Pittsburgh, yeah. but out here it's everywhere. And it's that... It's supposed to be traditional Chinese dancing, yeah, and the New Yorker did an article about it, asking, "Are they a cult?" And the too long don't read version of it is, yeah, basically. <laughs> what? <laughs> no, uh, tell me everything. <laughs> well, as with any conversation about religion, it's it depends on your definition of a cult, um, but basically, it's Chinese propaganda, and they have this weird imagery of Karl Marx in the production and all these weird things about, uh, I think it's authoritarianism and I'm shocked. Bizarre. I, 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 you thought the answer was going to be no. Yeah. I don't know what I shouldn't have thought that, but you just thought it was a dance troupe. Yes. Yeah. Me too. And I'm wondering if, Do white people go to this? Well, the reporter that wrote the story described the audience, and it was a lot of Asian folks, Mm -hmm. but of course, you're going to have a variety. Um, I think, yeah, I think a lot of people just really like dance, so they might be inclined to go, and they probably like that cultural experience that they might think of for the Asian culture, but I don't Mm -hmm. know. I've never been drawn to it. I never thought, oh, yeah, I want to go to that. So what elements of a cult does it embody or does it... So evidently they are funded by a religious organization whose name is not Shen Yun. It's uh, maybe something else. And they're trying to promote their message of religiosity and I guess political authoritarianism Mm. under the guise of, hey, this is traditional dance. You should like it. But they have these weird people that get up in the beginning and they're kind of like robots. They just say the same thing at every show and make it seem like it's just about dance when it's really about like, ah, I just said it. Um, Ah! (laughs) It's really about, I don't know, imperialism or something. And the religion is tied to political, cultural Blah, blah, blah. Is it all subliminal or do, can you watch and, and absolutely tell that this is what's happening? You can tell, but I think because their tradition is so unusual that a lot of people don't even know that that's what they're promoting. So, Man. It's explicit, but when you don't know the context, it just sort of feels weird and you think, oh, maybe this is because I'm not in this culture, so I don't know. Mm-hmm. I can understand that. And I yeah. wonder, so is, there, is it anything where there's some... They're asking for a donation. They're asking for some like, oh, money, or is it just more like propaganda of ideas? I think it's like propaganda whatever. of ideas know. with the maybe ultimate aim of recruiting new members to the recruiting um, new religion. new members like to the religion. Yeah. Okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> Weird, right? It is. I mean, it's like I just want my my. I know I'm saying it. Oh, uh, what's the end game? <laughs> That's What's what the, I was wondering. I think it's kind of like Scientology where I think it's clear that the end game is okay. just more money. Okay. So it is fine. Yeah. It always That's goes what down I, to fine. what I assume. Right. Money. Weird. It's just strange that I wouldn't have heard of it by now because usually all right. the cults, you know, I'm pretty on top of. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. Well, I'll have to look into it some more, but it's all very weird. Yeah. I yeah. wanted to give you a follow-up on that. Yeah. Also... You know how we have the tips that we give? Yes. I, I, maybe people are sick of it, but no, I, wanted to encourage, <laughs> I wanted to encourage people to follow 
on Instagram an account called Lingerie Addict. Oh, you incur- I, you know what? So funny. I was going to say this like two or three episodes ago because you inspired me to follow her and I'm so glad I do and oh. I think it's really important yes. that we recognize, you know, people of color in different like weight yeah. and average Just tell the people what it is first. Yeah, the Lingerie Addict is a woman who in the Instagram version, she models different beautiful lingerie pieces and um, and talks about the history of lingerie as well as, you know, ideas for how to wear it and what's beautiful and different brands. But also she has this message about body positivity, also sex positivity, and also encouraging uh, women of color and promoting their yes. projects. And that's something mm-hmm. I really think is important. But... The reason I followed her is because her images are so beautiful and she's so beautiful. Mm-hmm. I was like, I want to look at her more. And Did so you see that's her book? I her. Yes. It's gorgeous. It's gorgeous. And they're all like hand drawn illustrations of the lingerie and then like the stories about it. It's beautiful. So beautiful. I should have gotten just, you that as a gift. I was just Maybe thinking I, I need to get you that as a gift. <laughs> 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 right? Because it's like. Ugh. It's one of those things that you could display in your house, but also support um, something that's really cool yeah. and also pretty to look at. I think from her, you know how they have like in the discover section, like things based on who you follow and everything. And I think from her follow and some other ones I follow, I was looking at uh, an article or something on Instagram that said like, if you like want to representation in you know yes or like diversity in advertising and everything then make sure you are liking pictures of people that don't look like you Mm -hmm. to make sure that that gets you know recognition as well and it's so important to do that she even said that in a post recently she said you know white women in particular should you know be liking and commenting on and following women of color if you want to be sort of they might say is intersectional or just yeah. putting walking the walk. So yeah. do that. Follow her. It's, you won't yeah. be sorry. It's beautiful, beautiful yeah. pieces. Yep, 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 yep. Um, Love it. I have to tell you about this article that I read about. I, in essence, it was about millennials and how they have this reputation as being, you know, what would you say? Millennials. <laughs> <laughs> being millennials, <laughs> which Sarah is allowed to say because she is one, mm-hmm. so she can be all snotty about it. Yep. Um, I will say though, first of all, before I tell you about that, that a good thing that you'll want if you are following the laundry addict or not is a good bra. Oh, and yes, we know where to find one. Third love. Mm-hmm. These bras are designed to fit you whatever your size whatever your body looks like um and most they have more br- sizes than most other brands over 70 sizes including their signature half cup sizes i don't know why this isn't more prevalent and they have a perfect fit for everyone you just go on their fit finder quiz and uh put in some info about your body and they'll tell you what size you are and that way you don't have to go in for those awkward in-store fittings. No, thank Mm -hmm. you. Mm -hmm. Um, And they have a 100% fit guarantee. So you have 60 days, you can wear your bra, wash it, put it to the test. If you don't love it, return it and they'll uh, wash it and donate it to a woman in need. It's going to be the most comfortable bra you ever own. I will not wear any other bra. I'm I'm not into bras. So when I have to wear one, I better be comfy. Um, And they also have a new breathable cotton bra that you guys will love. Third Love knows there's a perfect bra for everyone. So right now they're offering our listeners 15% off your first order. Go to thirdlove.com slash brain now to find your perfect fitting bra and get 15% off your first purchase. That's thirdlove.com slash brain for 15% off today. So the article about the millennials Mm -hmm. was talking about somebody who went to college and Actually, I suppose it really wasn't about millennials as much as it is about their parents and this trend of what you might call snowplow parenting. Have you heard this term? Oh, yeah. Or the, yep, yep, yep. So instead of being helicopters, they're snowplowing all the obstacles out of their kid's way, which oh. became more talked about since this college cheating scandal. Yep. 
And they're talking about these parents who made your life so easy or make your life so easy that you don't know how to deal with obstacles when you're an adult. Absolutely. And it's awful. (laughs) Yeah. Okay. So you noticed this problem. Yes. (laughs) And um, one of the people that they talk about in the article is someone who went off to college who then went to the dormitory cafeteria and discovered that all the meals were covered in sauce and they had been shielded from sauce their whole life because they don't like sauce and didn't know how to cope with the fact that the cafeteria meals had sauce on them and had to drop out of school. Oh, I'm so... Oh, God. This is, you know, I dated a guy once who had a mother (laughs) like this. Okay. And you know him, Susie. You also met him. Oh, my God. He, his mom was like a short order cook for him. It was right. like, he was an only child. And if he didn't like something, she, as an adult, she would make a meal and, and he would say, mm, I don't really want that. And she would like make him something else. I'm like, mm-hmm. this is insane. Yeah. And I just knew that it had started very young. And my mom always said to me, I'm not a short order cook. If you want that, you eat what you, what I made and Absolutely. that's it. And tough. Tough potatoes if you don't want to (laughs) eat that. Like, yes. And, you know, she always said, like, no child ever stars themselves. So that kid who's like, no, I'm not eating when they're three. Yeah. There's no child. No, it goes against our, all they're doing is trying to make a point. No child is ever going to starve themselves. So if you're Mm -hmm. like, well, say, okay, then no dinner for you. In 20 minutes, they'll be back going, I'm hungry. You go, well, there you go. There's your food. And they will eventually eat it. Mm-hmm. And this whole thing of like, oh, no, I'll just make you whatever you want. This is what happens. It is not a good idea to do that. Yeah. This is just a small example of how doing that with food can really be, you know, the, like, oh, the weird so thing though to me. was someone was commenting on it on Twitter and the guy said, well, you guys are being unfair to this person because a sauce aversion is a real thing and you're being ableist. Oh, for Christ's sake. By... No, they're not. So, you know how... What, like your ability to eat sauce? <laughs> then, I don't off. know. Do, is there a thing where no. people... <laughs> the only thing I could think is if you are somewhere on the spectrum or you have OCD and... Yeah. But in that case, then you learn to cater to that and... The fact that this then then there's a failure of the parent because say this child does is like that and does not the the right thing to do as a parent will be to teach them how to be self sufficient and like find for themselves meals that don't I mean what what the heck <laughs> there are options I, cereal I mean what co- I just I, come on now I think you're right though that let's say you actually have OCD or something that does prohibit you from enjoying the texture of certain foods in yeah. a way that is typical, yes. um, th- that your parent would or doctor would most likely prepare you for, yes. here's how... So I can't imagine that that's what this is. No, it's not. It's just a kid being... Ugh. You, you know, know those and- folks that order pizza and they get the sauce not on it because some kids hate pizza sauce. Mm-hmm. Maybe it's that, but then it just carries on their whole life type of thing. Yeah. But, yeah. I mean, it's just everybody catering to the needs of the one versus the one adapting to the need. Like, I don't know. I just think it's not good. And I just I don't just- think you should drop out of school because of sauce. No, I'm trying to think of what, you know, So, so obviously there's more at play here you know like you have to look at you know um what is it called it's called there's a name for it like the transition into college it's like really it's like a phase of life problem but there's there is something that happens when you these children launch and if they trend if they if the parent and the child don't like if the relationship doesn't evolve, then there can be so much anxiety for the child as they like leave and yeah. transition that that's really it. It's like the, and you look at a parent like this and it's like the parent's anxiety matched with the child's inability to like feel confident in their own decisions and rely on the parent. And then, you know, it just makes for like, ugh. Well, you and I were talking about privately how the cheating scandal made me realize that that by doing that, by being a snowplow parent, 
-hmm. it's you're doing the same thing like the rich parents and the poor parents end up doing a similar thing remember how we were saying like being spoiled is almost like your parents don't believe in you i'm i'm missaying what we had said right Uh, because it wasn't about poor parents it was about like Oh, being spoiled and being neglected or something yes. is yes. basically the same where on both end, it's like your parents don't believe in you mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. that you can't do it on your own. I wish yes. you could remember. That it's, to- it's, it's that you did a good job of rephrase, like paraphrasing like that. But, but in essence, it- by spoiling your kid, you're actually saying you're not, you can't do it on your own. You yes. can't get into the college on your own or whatever. The same way if you were one of those critical parents who was like either – you know, neglect their child or was verbally abusive. Like you can't do it. You're, you're, yes, sending, you're not you're sending the same. Me- you're not enough. You're telling Thank the child. You. You're, yes. It's the neglect. Like you're not enough for my energy versus you're not enough to even be good enough on your own. I do need to explore though, what causes it because I fight against it, but I have the same impulse with my son where I I'm so paranoid about him getting hurt physically or emotionally that I really have to fight against my Mm -hmm. instinct to protect him from all of that. You know what I go back to is the article that you had shared a long time ago about how the most important thing a child sees and the lesson that the child learns the most from is failure Mm -hmm. and our ability to overcome failure. So yeah, you tried it and then you still failed and got back up. The same way, you know, you get hurt, you, you know, break your arm, you put a cast on and you get better and it's okay. And like, there can't be those, those big, you know, you just, just to almost yeah. like teach resilience. It's a hard thing to do. I don't know why our generation struggles as parents to allow our kids to experience I, pain, but we I do. think cause we live in a, a we're fear. I think mm-hmm. it's a fear thing. And mm-hmm. I think it's like any little bit of uncomfortability we're taught to f- like fight against or whatever it is you know we're just like not comfortable with being even a tiny bit uncomfortable and we need to be i have been thinking about that so much when we were at that event and flip the ninja guy teaches that like get comfortable with being uncomfortable Mm -hmm. and i think that is so applicable because for a while i think i was in survival mode as a human being and a parent as well and mm-hmm. i'm only now being like no i'm going to be uncomfortable and it's okay and it'll actually make my life better but you have yes. to really be intentional about it yeah cuz my the, yeah, instinct is totally. to be like nope i want to be comfortable i want to be safe i want to be whatever yeah. and i have to fight and be like nope i'm going to go out, i'm going to go surfing and it's going to suck and i'm going to fall but it's okay because yeah. then you'll be glad you did it. And it's just the idea. It's our anticipation and our overthinking of the yes, like, uh, the expected outcome. And then when you actually do it, and I think about this every time, uh, you know, really it's the challenge that taught me this. Me too. That I had no idea in a million years I would be able to survive standing in one place for yes. hours in the middle of a, a glacier and you know i'm just, i i laughed the other day because landon and i are doing this big road trip and we got a uh a pass to do this really intense hike through the narrows in zion and it's a beautiful hike it's but it's really strenuous it's like 12 or 16 miles or something and you know i have not been like working out or like training in a long time yeah. and uh, with like the exception of like my 10 minute videos you know yeah. but like not hike style yeah. and lands like like okay this is gonna be like a real star newest hike and i look at him and i'm like honey <laughs> i think have I'm we good. met <laughs> yeah i'm like i think even without any like anything is gonna be easier and i was like do you think it'll be more difficult than climbing one of the toughest climbs in norway after jumping out of a helicopter freezing free like paddling 10 yeah. miles through a glacier water and then having to spend all night sleeping on a wooden pallet do you think it'll be a little easier than that oh i think i'll be good you yeah <laughs> and he's like i'm just, he was being so sweet he's like i'm just checking i'm just making sure like yeah. you know but in my head i'm just like I'm a survivor and that's what you I'm are. saying. Like you're comfortable with being on un- and there is no amount of yeah, and if I am uncomfortable, I'm gonna push through it and then at the end I'm gonna be like, damn, look at how fun that was. Yeah. And I was telling Adam, I said, you know, when I would be on a challenge, I would be uncomfortable for eight straight weeks or however long it was. Mm-hmm. And then what I'm trying to do now is take a touch of that 
and yes. to put it in my real life because yes. you don't want to be uncomfortable all the time. Like a challenge that is very mm-hmm. difficult and I'm in that state of survival the entire time. But if you can just do that for a minute in your real life or a day or whatever, then that is the sweet spot for me. It's the same thing as all those like cliche sayings that people have of like, do every day do something that scares you. It's true or, though. Yeah. It's so true. It's you're basically building up resilience. Yeah. You know, and then you go, Oh, that wasn't that bad. Yes. That wasn't that scary. Whatever it is, maybe for you it's climbing a mountain, but maybe for other people it's saying hello to somebody yes. you don't know. Totally. And everybody it's different. And maybe you're great at saying hello to somebody you don't know, but you're not good at taking the first leap and being physically uncomfortable. Like mm-hmm. people are uncomfortable and comfortable in different places. Maybe emotionally yeah. there, but not physically, vice versa. So yeah, there's that's that's great, man. It's a good lesson. It sure is. We should remember that. And one one place that I'm always comfortable though is in my bed. Mm. And that's because I have the best sheets ever. Brooklyn. Hell yeah. <laughs> Hell yeah. <laughs> you spend a third of your life in sheets. And so you need a bedding upgrade. This is what I'm saying. If you want to feel like you're in a five star hotel, but you don't want to like, you know, break the bank, then you can try Brooklyn because these sheets are so comfy and soft. You can get all different patterns, mix and match, and you're going to not want to get out of your bed. That's what I'm saying. Mm. It's the fastest growing bedding brand in the world. Um, And they also have other things. They have pillows, uh, towels, uh, comforters. And I saw online they have a shower curtain now, which I did not know and I want to check out. Um, Brooklyn and sheets are the best, most comfortable sheets I've ever slept on. Now it's your turn for the upgrade. Brooklyn.com is giving an exclusive offer just for our listeners. Get 10% off your first order and free shipping when you use promo code brain at Brooklyn.com. Brooklyn is so confident in their product that all their sheets, comforters, and towels come with a lifetime warranty. The only way to get 10% off your first order and free shipping is to use promo code brain at Brooklyn.com. That's B-R-O-O-K-L-I-N-E-N.com, promo code brain. Mm -hmm. Brooklyn, and these are the best sheets ever. I say hell yeah because uh, Landon gave me the thumbs up to like you know get some new colors and stuff for our. We went to a hotel and we're on really nice sheets, and he's like, "Oh, I love white sheets, and these feel so comfy." And I'm like, "You know, we can th- we can have this. <laughs> this and is he's doable. Like, yeah, let's get it." And then he's like, "Oh, I want a feather bed too." So I'm like in the mindset of like, "Oh, what am I going to get? I'm going to get like a nice new comforter and da 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 da." So. And you can. The thing is, when you do something like that, it's almost like renovating your whole room. It but totally you're just is. Getting That's I'm so excited. That's why I have to take a while to decide what colors I want. I like yeah. put it in my shopping cart and then think for a week. You're funny like that. Why do you I always know. do that? I don't know. Because like it's half the fun for me yeah. is just planning it. Yeah. You know? So I like doing that. You're real cute. Oh, thanks, Sus. <laughs> You're also um, equally adorable. <laughs> So I have a mystery for you to solve, and I don't have the answer. You're just going to have to tell me your theory. Okay, I read this article about how, about Whiteout, and Mm -hmm. it was giving a little bit of the history of Whiteout and how you remember the Invented by a secretary. Is that mythology? Is that true? Well, it is. It's the secretary you mentioned, but her son was in the monkeys, Mike Nesmith. That's funny. (laughs) And I always remember people saying that about him, and I thought, that's probably one of those old... What do they call that? Um, urban legends. Mm-hmm. But it's actually true, and that she became a millionaire because she came up with this idea. It's awesome. Yeah, and when you were growing up, you did you use whiteout and stuff? Yep. It's, yeah, totally. But then they were saying how it's recently started to go up in sales, and they can't kind of figure out why. Wait, like who's using really? whiteout? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Mystery. <laughs> Why is whiteout being now? Is it specifically because here's the interesting thing? Now, are we talking about whiteout in its classic, like in the classic sense of like the little bottle with the yes. brush? Yes. Okay, that's so freaking weird that those yes. are going up. It's got to be used for something else because that's yes. I've gone away from that. I use the little roller. Yeah, yeah, the pieces of those paper. things that, mm-hmm. that you know. This is the liquid paper version with the brush. Okay. There's definitely something else that this is being used yeah, for. Yeah, what? How do they not have any ideas or theories? They said, like, some people think it's a certain kind of craft, maybe on Pinterest. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. I'm like, we got to look on Pinterest and see what 
alternative uses for whiteout. Do you think people are using it for that slime <laughs> or something? That would be dumb. It would ruin everything. Yeah, and Good there's too many glue. chemicals that don't go with. Some people <sighs> think that people are just sniffing it. That was my and that was my first guess. <laughs> really? Yep. <gasps> That's what that was my first instinct. Okay. Because because it has all the same like the chemical comp like content is is high enough to do that, but you know like the the other things they they keep track of or they they like limit how many you can buy of like the dust off and yeah. all that. I'm think I my ugh. yeah my instinct was. Yeah, Do you that think that's really it? Drug use or whatever, but uh, I feel like I just got to Google whiteout. The article that I read was in the Atlantic, but there was no conclusion. And that's why I'm like, well, ah, Sarah, she probably knows. You're in like that weird Pinterest sniffing <laughs> subculture. Uh-huh. <laughs> sniffing subculture? Not, no way. <laughs> totally joking. Get out of here. I just know about weird stuff like that. <laughs> I don't know, but they were talking about how the people at Whiteout are working on different labels and things so that it, I don't know, the product is easier to put on Instagram, kind of like they did with LaCroix where it was a very Instagrammable product and so it went up in sales. But come mm-hmm. on, who's going to take a picture no, of Whiteout? It's not that, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm, pretty, I'm pretty convinced it's the huffing thing. Dang. Do you because think you when could get I Googled, high on whiteout? Yep. When I Google uh, right here, when I Google uh, whiteout and huffing, it come all these Stop. stories come up. It says inhalant abuse videos, uh, whiteout inhalant abuse prevention, Ohio early warning alert, National Inhalant Prevention Coalition talking about whiteout correctional fluid and how some people are kids are like painting it on their nails and then oh. huffing can be deadly. Is your kid doing it? Yeah. This that. Do you mm-hmm, think people mm-hmm. are using it as nail polish and then sniffing it? I guess it's maybe I don't know. I think they're they're I, oh, that it, that really creeps me out. Why? The idea just that huff is just one of the grossest things to me. I think when I was probably like fourteen or fifteen, I saw the movie Gummo. Have you heard of that movie? Never. It's by the same director, producer, writer, whoever it was that did the movie Kids. Okay. Have you heard of that movie? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Like really uh, dark. cult clumming of age movie that's super dark and, you know, but really realistic. Yeah. Insightful. And, and yeah. Yes. And it's the same kind of story about a small town in the middle of who knows where, where people have like m- generations of huffing and like drug use. And you, all the people in the movie are actual children who are you know, have deformities or neurological, you know, like, uh, they took like real people and used them as actors for this and for some of the scenes. And I just remember those scenes being so difficult to look at. And I just, it really grossed me out. And like this movie was so intense. I have this serious, like reaction to that. I, oh, it like really grosses me out. It was too raw. Yeah. Like Mm. I can't watch intervention. I can't, it's like too, I get too scared and I think, wow, what kind of place does a person have to be in to go to that kind of length to change their, like, you have to be in a lot of pain to put your body through that much pain to feel either yeah. numb or okay or bet like, how much pain do you have to be experiencing for that to make you feel better? It's like, mm-hmm. ooh, for that scary to be an improvement. To me. Yes, yes, yes. And it the, like breaks my heart. Some of the worst episodes of intervention were with people that huff for those yes. air cans. Yeah. Oh, and, they and I just think ugh, lose it, it just makes me so, yes, and it's so scary. And they're high on that stuff is only a couple minutes, mm-hmm. and then they'll just keep sucking on that air, and they get it's almost like they're possessed. I it, oh, it may, I don't know. It makes me feel so weird. Inside. What the heck does it do to their brain? Oh, the worst stuff kills yeah. brain cells. Oh, it, it really does. It kills. Brain yes. Cells. Yeah, absolutely. And then it's irreversible. Yes. Well, don't do that, kids. A lot of it. Do not. Uh, oh, my God. We should not be. It really scares me. Wow. You don't usually react like that. I know. Uh, this one is, is that is my, ugh. yeah. 
Really? Because that movie, I know it. It just, I watched it during an age where I was like, yeah, you know, and oh my God, I was like that kid who was, I would have nightmares that, you know, my, my, like the, oh, I had this re- reoccurring dream that like, you know, I'm such a rule follower that when dare, the dare program came, I became like the, 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 basically like that, what's her name? Flick from election. I became like Tracy. her, Tracy Flick from Election. I became her for like D.A.R.E. program. I was like, we are going to fight the drug. No drugs. No smoking. Cigarettes are killing you. And I would have this reoccurring nightmare where like everybody I knew and loved would one by one look at me and say, I'm sorry, and pick up a cigarette and start smoking. I'd be like, no. no. And it was like so sad. And so I, I was like so anti like all of that. I'm like, I don't know. So and then all you that were- stuff. Picking up doobies in no time. Yeah. Well, I, oh, no, it was a long time. I was over 21, <laughs> but the first time I smoked weed. Did you feel super guilty, though? In England. No, I didn't for some reason. Really? After all yeah. your spouting about dare to keep kids off drugs. Yeah. I don't know why, because I, I don't know. I felt like, oh, I'm in England. It's okay or something. Damn it. Uh, uh, you are a tough nut to crack. Who knows? But yeah, oh my god, that first night I smoked weed, I was in I was in England, and it, I we were with some friends on a exchange program out there, and living out there in Oxford, and living your uh, best life, living my best life. And somebody offered me some, and then I didn't inhale, and they're like, "No, no, you have to like breathe <laughs> in." And then I did, and then like <laughs> coughed everywhere, and then I got kicked out of a McDonald's for laughing too much. Oh Lord, of course <laughs> you did. Because it was Easter time and they had a Cadbury McFlurry and for some reason an egg inside like the, the they made it look like an egg. I could not stop laughing at like I'm like, it's like an egg in the McFlurry. You're the worst. I was, they're like, ma'am, you have to leave. But they probably miss at the time. You have been kicked out of so many establishments. Really? Yeah, you weren't you kicked out of a museum? Oh yep, for taking a picture. <laughs> and like maybe we did a go library. Over this. Yep. Yep. Oh, I banned from the library for not returning my book. See, I don't know. I haven't gone back. For being a rule follower, Sarah. Right. T- true. True. I should just abandon that label. Well, one thing you should not abandon is your Rafis. Oh, never, ever. In fact, funny story, walking down the street the other day, I was wearing them and this other girl was wearing them and she was like <laughs> in the middle of the conversation, but I couldn't, I didn't, this is a total stranger. And I was like, hey, good taste in shoes. But then she didn't hear me. And then I was like, <laughs> okay, good talk. And just kept walking. <laughs> but I really wanted to connect on our Rothy shoes because we were pa- wearing the exact same red ones. And when I see them in public, it feels like I've like met a member of like, I don't know, a <laughs> tribe society. that I didn't know I belonged to. Yes. <laughs> Rothy's are the most loved, gotta have them shoes, and they are stylish, sustainable, comfortable, washable. Think about this. I wore them the entire time I was in Hawaii and washed them while we were there. You can just wash them in the sink if you want. They cleaned up perfectly. White shoes. Did you see the red dirt that I was walking on? <gasps> you like, walked in that red dirt with your white wa- Rothy's and they were fine. Yes. Not on okay. the day that, of that picture, but I did. Because then you just wash them and they cleaned up perfectly. Yes. Damn, they are the that's perfect good. shoe for life on the go. They have different styles too. So you can get like a dressier version if you're going to be going to work. Or you can get the sneakers like I have and they are just perfect for every day. It will blow in your mind that they are made from recycled plastic water bottles. Sarah was just talking about that. And they've saved over 25 million water bottles from landfills, which is awesome. Amazing. Right now, Rothy's has an amazing deal for our listeners. Use code Brain Candy to get free shipping with no minimum, free shipping and free returns and exchanges on your Rothy's shoe. And trust me, you won't return them. Go to rothys.com, R O T H Y S.com, and enter Brain Candy to get your new favorite flats and free shipping. Once you try shoes that are comfortable, stylish, and sustainable, you're never going to wear anything else. Head to rothys.com and claim this offer with code Brain Candy. Well, so you had you had told me about a mystery that uh, we hadn't solved with the whiteout, but I have a story for you about a mystery that they did solve. Yes. So this one is so random. I had like I went, I found a bunch of really interesting articles on BBC the other week, and just like one of those, this article led to this article and this yeah. article, and I was looking at the, all the recycling stuff and like those. You know, what they're doing in the ocean, which led me to an article on some mysterious things that have been washing up on the shores of France for the last 30 plus years. So oh my God, ex- I have that too. 
Oh, that's so cool. It's so funny, right? Yes. Tell the people. Okay. So for like, since the 1980s, there have been these (laughs) sightings of parts of the Garfield telephone yes. so remember those garfield telephones from the 80s where it's like him crouched down you like pick up his back or something and that's the phone <laughs> and down. pieces of those have been showing up all along the shore and people are like what the heck and right. they've even become a symbol of like the need like why we need to recycle and ab- ab- like environmental right um activism. i don't know like s- yes activism this symbol <laughs> and people could not figure out what the heck it was from and then finally i don't know whether they discovered where it was or found the location yeah. somebody said they knew what they could found have happened. it a shipping container had gone down during a storm in 1980 and they were all it was full of garfield yes. phones yes that's so funny to me. That is the best. And the pictures of the phones in the sand. So funny. <laughs> Suze, I have them right here to show you. <laughs> <laughs> They're so great because they it are. kind of would be creepy if you were just on the beach and all these Garfields were coming Like to- the weirdest thing. <laughs> right. I love it. And I love that then they found the shipping container. It was in a sea cave. <laughs> and they're like, oh, here's where they're coming from. <laughs> And there were still like c- parts of the phone, like more phones in there. Yeah. Like, it had was they just not discovered huge... this mystery, it would have just been washing up for. I just it... think about how many people didn't get their Garfield phone and it was just abandoned in the shipping container. Right. I guess they weren't like ordering it online like then, but it just <laughs> right. didn't well, make I... it. I guess so. It just didn't make it to a particular yeah. store or something. What if there was like a wait list at the store and these people <laughs> are like, my Garfield phone. And they were like, they said it would be here in two weeks. Did you ever have a novelty phone? Oh, you know what? I wasn't allowed to have a phone. Oh, why? My mom was really big on that. Like I had a friend who had a phone in her bedroom when yeah. she was really young and almost as like a, a protest you know, my mom was like, this fa- this par- this child's parent gives their kids everything they want and they have, you know, the phone in their room at five. I can't even believe that. And what else? You know, like, so my mom was like that. No, we're not having phones in the room. And uh, oh, I didn't, it was always the family phone. I'm trying to think, did I ever have a novelty phone? Well, I can remember the phone my friend had, which was a novelty phone. I loved it. Uh, I did not have a novelty <laughs> phone i only had the family phone yep oh, that and is the long ass cord i know did you yeah oh my god tell me what you had i had one of those ones that was clear and you could see the parts oh. inside nope i take it back i had that one <laughs> yep. of course now that you say we have it, the same one i had that that's it and you know what in my mind it didn't even register as novelty because it just was like sciency like Oh it's just a God. phone where you could see the parts. I was thinking like lip shaped or I was thinking of a shape. I also did eventually have, you know, those ones that are vertical and they sit there and then you hold the one thing up to your ear and then the mouthpiece is on the base, like an old timey. No. Oh my nine, God. You know, How that funny. Kind. Yeah. Like re- like throwback. Yeah. Old schooly. Yes. And it was super cute and I loved it, but it was really un- not convenient. Yeah. That seems <laughs> like one of those or... Mm. <laughs> that would have been that's good if funny, I had though. Instagram. Yeah. Yeah. That's Back real then. cute, Suze. But huh. then eventually... Why did I block that plastic phone? Like, I'm trying to think yeah, of which room I had that in. It. And then, because and then, like, I know I, I can remember that phone. So definitely at one point in time had yeah. a phone in my room. But I'm wondering if I was like an adult when I bought that. Yeah. You must have been in high school or something. Yeah. Because I, or, you know, yeah. Mm-hmm. Definitely was it when I was a kid because that was foreboding. Foreboding. Yeah, when those, they had cords, like you said, <clears throat> excuse me, and they, you would stretch the cord because you'd want privacy. Ugh, and so you try that. to get the cord to reach wherever you were going to sit. And the cord would end up all mangled. Oh, I hated that. <laughs> and then when it would do that twist thing, and then there would be, before yes. I would be able to answer the call, I would have to hold it and then just watch it untwist. And I am so like, I, a little OCD that I have to, I, ha, I just did a lot of like, I spent a lot of time organizing that cord when I was on phone <laughs> organizing. calls. Organizing. Yeah. I had this little, this friend, this guy who was, 
Oh, he was so sweet. Uh, he he was like his family had just moved to the United States from Vietnam and he was really trying hard to make friends and he was so sweet and he would call me every day after school and we would talk on the phone and my mom Aww. would be like oh, Finn's on the phone here you go and I would talk to him <laughs> so and cute. we would just have our afternoon talks and you know and I just remember sitting there and untangling the cord and because he just wanted to chat you know sure. it was like you know and I that's what you'd always do there would always be a debriefing after the school yeah. day then you talk to somebody but it's weird how kids don't do that now they text or Ugh, whatever yeah. only i mean i don't blame them i hate phone calls but mm. it's just we only hate them now because yeah. we don't have to do it <laughs> is that why i think you didn't hate them when you were before no i didn't hate them when i was you a kid. loved them yeah i loved them yeah hmm. I, I, you're I one of the cool. only people for whom i will answer the phone Oh, you too, sis. I think there's about maybe seven people that Aww. they'll call and I'll just pick up. Yes, I may. How many people would you say you'll answer? Everybody. I've seen you answer unknown even. Uh, You're real brave about that. Well, no, <laughs> I know. I answer the unknown one because my I know that my aunt always calls from an unknown number. For some okay. reason, her home phone is like blocked. So usually when it's unknown, it's definitely my aunt. When it's, when it's like a... a like rando number i won't answer have you seen the new thing that some phone companies are doing where they'll put at the top uh likely scam or yeah i downloaded a thing on my phone to do that from verizon oh what did you download there's like some verizon app that you can get for i it. have to do that yeah and it at the top will be a red bar that's a spam and do you get calls that say that yeah get and well and then it starts out. to filter them out See, you know, John is... Oliver just did a whole thing on spam calls. You should watch really? that. Yeah. I saw there was an article in New York Mag about end of robocalls and how it's kind of like um, junk mail yeah. when it would come to your house. And now that's, I mean, you still get some, but not like you used to. And same with junk email. It now is mm-hmm. filtered into that other folder. Mm-hmm. And so I think finally phones are catching up. <laughs> yeah, there's uh, there's definitely more at play like when i saw this thing on john oliver i'm like oh, okay this is why that i can't i can't summarize it because i don't even remember like what the points mm-hmm. are but like well enough to be able to say anything and like like i don't know was it essentially just that it's big business and yeah kind of like yeah. that but then also just how it affects people and who's responsible and how they're really not doing anything and oh and then John Oliver did one of his classic things where the people who are supposed to be passing the laws like aren't doing it. Oh. And, and so he set up spam callers to call them every <laughs> five minutes, no. like just like they had done to some people. And, oh, it's like classic John Oliver, and I love when they do that. Um, but, yeah, you just find out. The, and on there, they, he says like a, some statistic on – the percentage of calls that we get that are spam versus not spam. And it's crazy. It's an, I didn't even expect it. I want to say it's like 90% or something insane like wow. that of what, well, and yeah. it's like, why is this a thing? Like nobody, everybody's terrified to answer their phone now. Like maybe yeah. that's why you don't like the phone calls as much because our first instinct is like, Oh, is it one of those fake ones? And I saw this comedy bit where somebody was talking about how if your phone rings, you like, quickly try to get your phone out and look at it and no matter who it says we push decline <laughs> like we're desperate to look and it'll be like oh right. it's my husband decline <laughs> <laughs> that's so funny yeah you think we're rushing to get it to answer it and then we're just rushing to look to have a little bit of power in that moment <laughs> most of the time though nope. when you get a call don't you think why didn't they just text me no i well um no because i think like the friends who call me like always there's more to it yes yeah you know and they're like friends that i haven't talked to in a long time like i can go through my head of the people who i'm gonna like no i i will answer a phone call for i'm like Allie, i Mm -hmm. she and i have been playing phone tag for like three weeks gosh darn it shout out to Allie. um (laughs) uh and uh uh no, but like when I see her call, I always want to answer it because I know that we're going to be able to catch up and talk and she moved to another state. So I'm like really excited to talk to her. And so a lot of times the calls I'll get will, will just be from friends that I haven't been able to catch up with for a while. And so I yeah. really want, you know, given that I'm next to my phone and not like in a session or, you know, 
something like that I want to answer and want to talk. So usually people don't just call me to ask a question or, you know, they don't ever <laughs> call me with something that could be text. Is what right. I'm at. Okay. Okay. You know, that's the real point. I'm I get a lot of those calls and I'm just like, really? Just text me. Come on. <laughs> I think it's a generational thing. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. That like if you grew up with like the yeah yeah more of like the chit chat on the phone versus doesn't it freak you out like we have a friend scooter who doesn't have a cell phone yeah and doesn't that kind of freak you out uh it oh, only you're freaks kind me of anti phone because I am anti phone but it only freaks me out because of the industry that I'm in now or business that I'm in now where I have to check my voicemail twice a day I have yeah. to like if I. When, when the time comes that I have my own practice, I'll have to really be like available via phone all the time because if you have a client who's in a crisis and, you know, you have to kind of be able, you know, to be there. Yeah, and you're not kind be of off on the call. grid. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. I can't do that. I have to Man, always be Man, that's going to be an in. adjustment for you. Well, you know, I've been do I, I set my alarm and then twice a day my yeah. alarm goes off and I check my voicemail then. And, you know, it's not. And the guy makes sure that the boundaries are really clear with my clients about when they know I'm going to check it, when to leave a voicemail, blah, blah, blah. So, yeah, you know. Yeah. You, they um, teach you all that stuff and you slowly learn it. So. Oh, poor Sarah. <laughs> Not poor um, Sarah. P.S. I forgot to tell you. How about how, you know, we've talked about on this show about cilantro and how some of us have that gene yes. that makes it gross. Yes. Did you know that there's a similar thing with cucumber? No. Some people think cucumbers are disgusting, but they're delicious and refreshing. I <laughs> oh, right? I, I need to meet a cucumber, uh, 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 somebody who's anti anti cucumber. Apparently, it's the same thing where there's a recessive me. gene that <sighs> for them makes cucumbers essentially inedible, and often though those same people are fine with pickles which seems counterintuitive. But that's the same way that you're fine with it if it's crushed up. If it's in salsa, yeah. It's because it's been like that. Oh, cool. Something else for me to research. I just can't imagine hating cucumbers. Me neither. But I couldn't imagine hating cilantro. Right. So but interesting. It's really gross for them. So yeah. I, solidarity. Also follow up. Uh, I asked Landon about wasabi. What did he say? We did not have any in the house at the time, okay. but uh, he told me <laughs> that the, basically a lot of the same things you said, like the stuff that we're eating is not the real wasabi, and mm. that wasabi grows at the rate of one inch a year. And mm-hmm. he said it looks kind of like if you were to marry, like a pineapple and a carrot got together and had a baby. Yeah. So kind of like what you said, that's what it mm-hmm. looks like. And that originally what it's used for in Japan, like they have a lot of um, tradition, of course, and a lot of like ritual around how to prepare it, things like that. And to grate it, it's grated on shark skin. Like Ooh. they take shark skin and they use shark skin to grate it. And I asked him like, well, what, what, what's like the, the purpose? Like what do they use it for? And he said the reason why it's eaten with sushi is because it's antibacterial. Oh. Yeah. Really? And he's like, there you go. Wealth of knowledge over here. I know yes. everything. About- I say, I'm like, I knew you were going to know all about this. That's and really yeah, cool. It's antibacterial. So if there is, ba- like the fish has that anything in it that it like works to, it makes yeah. sense if you're eating raw fish. Because in the video, it did say that um, science shows that it does fight against cancer and helps general health. So I'm sure that you're right. Yeah. That that's cool. how it became. Wonder why ginger got involved though. Oh, you know, good, the ginger. good question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, know it's a I think that was just. Cleanser, but. Oh yeah, that's what I was going to say. I think it's something mm. like that. Well, we've really made it. a lot of progress on our. Yes. You know, oh, wasabi fun episode. Just invest- love it. Investigation. I mean, we. How could it be bad when you started with the history of the high five? Uh that is correct. You're making days over here. You know, and um, also when this airs, I think will be the week of National High Five Day. No. It's the third week of April. Oh, my God. Then then yes. April. Yeah. It's going to be that time. So I like also timed it well. You're welcome. <laughs> Wait, what is involved in this celebration though? Okay. So I think it's the University of Virginia is where this got started, where they set up a booth where they sold like lemonade and high fives (laughs) and like raised money for charity. And so now it's like a thing where they like go around to 
I don't know. It's it's something for. It's almost like a high five a thon. And that it's is all, really cute. Uh huh. So it started there, and, and then it just became like a thing. Love that. Yeah. Well, happy so high celebrate. Five high five to you, today. Zeus. High five to you. We'll be high fiving. Yes, we uh, will. To celebrate, and we'll and if you're going to high you. five, if you're going to high five, make sure to look at the elbow. That's how you can guarantee contact. What? If, why do people say that? Because it works. Do it. <laughs> test it. We'll test it and get a video for you and make sure you can see. We'll do it with and without some experiments. All right, everybody. We'll high five you if you leave us a review and uh, make it a good one. All right. Bye, guys. Bye. This podcast is brought to you by Wave Podcast Network. Check out all of our shows, including the Brain Candy Podcast, I Don't Get It, Coffee Convos, and Let's Talk About It. 